All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to this uh, special event that is hosted by the Society of Applied Philosophy. Uh, and the special event, of course, is the webinar with Professor Paul Griffith. Now, Paul is a colleague of mine here in the philosophy department. He's also uh, so not only a professor of philosophy, but also an ARC uh, Laureate Fellow. Um, and he focuses, he's a philosopher of science who focuses on the life sciences. He heads uh, the theory and methods in bioscience group at the Charles Perkins Center. Uh, and he's also uh, runs the ARC Laureate Project, a philosophy of medicine for the 21st century. And Paul's uh, publications include the 1997 famous book, What the Emotions Really Are, uh, The Problem of Psychological Categories, Sex and Death from 1999, and Genetics and Philosophy, an introduction with Corolla Stotts from 2013. Um, the title of his presentation is uh, Process. Oh, and Paul is also a great mentor to the junior faculty here in the philosophy department. That's also an important part of his uh, when it comes to giving you a short bio. And today uh, he's going to give a talk entitled A Process Theory of Biological Sex. Paul. Oh, thanks for that kind introduction. Thanks to everybody for turning out. Um, so without more ado, let me start. I'm sure we'll have any amount to talk about. So I'll share my screen. And start the presentation. One other thing I want to do. Which is Oh, there we go. Okay, so um, I'm going to try and do four things in this talk. First one is to uh, tell a story about what biologists are trying to, to explain when they distinguish sexes within a species. So sometimes we're going to talk about species containing several distinct sexes, sometimes we're not what's going on when we make these distinctions within a species. Having done that, I'm gonna explain how that in turn relates to well-known ideas of chromosomal sex and phenotypic sex. And I guess the, uh, um, the spoiler alert is that I'm gonna argue that chromosomal and phenotypic sexes are derived from a deeper understanding of biological sex. Then what I'm gonna do is switch gears and look at what it means to identify an individual organism as uh, being a member of one sex. I'm gonna show that that's only quite distantly and quite complicatedly related to ascribing a number of sexes to a species. And I'm going to show that while it's fairly straightforward to think about the sex of a gamete producing individual, um, it's surprisingly complicated and surprisingly, uh, the, uh, the attribution of sexes to non-gamete producing individuals um, is actually quite a sort of shaky game. Um, it's a matter of sort of stretching concepts in various um, sensible but not um, sort of compulsory ways. And finally, having talked a great deal about uh, the biology of sex, I'm going to ask how this view of biological sex relates to the philosophy of sex um, and to the concerns of contemporary philosophers. And again, the spoiler alert, the uh, argument I'm gonna make is that the biology of sex um, does very little work in the philosophy of sex. And so the main reason for paying so much attention to the biology is to counter the idea that substantial philosophical lessons can be draw drawn directly from the biology. So I want to start by talking about species, because I'm going to be talking about uh, ascribing a number of sexes to a species. And I want to make clear that I'm working in a very conventional neo-Darwinian conception of species. So the diagram on the right there is a famous diagram from the work of Hennig. Um, at the top, we've got species A giving rise to two descendant species B and C. That might be the common ancestor of humans and chimps giving rise to humans and chimps. And the, expand, the thing underneath is an expansion diagram. 
what's going on there is that a large number of individuals are um, having offspring and that some force or other which might be geographical separation or um, uh, the emergence of two regions of niche space that require different uh, modes of exploitation, that something or other is driving this, if this um, genealogical nexus apart into two uh, different genealogical nexuses. So a key part of this Darwinian approach is that there is no essential or ideal type of a species and that in a biological species, genetically and phenotypically diverse individuals are united in a pattern of ancestry and descent. So what holds a species together is the pattern of ancestry and descent. Now, as with everything in philosophy of biology, there's lots more to say about species, um, but I'm going to uh, um, assert that this is a widely accepted uh, way of thinking about particularly animal species, um, and that by appealing to these ideas, I'm not appealing to anything particularly controversial. So the fact that this is what I mean by a species will come to be important later on in the, in the talk. Okay, so let's get on to sex. What I'm fundamentally going to be talking about is the literature on the evolution of sex. And the literature on the evolution of sex is very extensive. It's a body of theory which organizes the data on the many ways in which DNA is used to make new individuals across the diversity of life. And it allows the formulation and testing of hypotheses about the origins and maintenance of this diversity in evolution. So different species combine DNA in different ways in order to reproduce. And what we're trying to understand is how those ways came to exist and why they're maintained. Now, the exchange of DNA between bacteria and viruses is much more complex than between eukaryotes, eukaryotes, um, animals, plants, fungi, and several groups of single cell organisms. I'm not going to talk about what's going on in bacteria and viruses. Uh, identifying what you want to regard in bacteria and viruses as sex is conceptually challenging in itself. And what's more, nobody really draws many lessons for uh, thinking about uh, sex in the philosophy of sex from what's going on with bacteria and viruses. They're much more likely to draw lessons from uh, eukaryotic organisms. And just a critical point, I'm going to explain some horribly basic things that many of you I know will be very bored by, but um, they're things that I can't just take for granted because I know uh, a lot of you aren't either philosophers of biology or biologists. Um, so just the point that uh, sexual eukaryotes, eukaryotic organisms that, that reproduce sexually, produce things called gametes. And gametes are cells with a reduced chromosome number which recombine to make a new individual with the original chromosome number. Okay, so when we're talking about gametes, we're talking about the cells in human beings, sperm and eggs, which have this reduced chromosome number. So here are some glossary entries. I've pulled these particular ones from an article by some well-known uh, sex researchers, but they are, they're simply, you know, you, you would find the same definitions in any dictionary of biology or online teaching site. So first of all, a definition of anisogamy, which just means not, not equal gametes. So anisogamy is a form of sexual reproduction in which the fusing gametes are of markedly unequal size. The sexes are defined according to anisogamy. The sex with the smaller gametes is defined as male. In the absence of anisogamy, that's isogamy or equal gametes, one speaks of mating types rather than separate sexes. I'm going to avoid talking about mating types. It's complicated. Uh, if people want to talk about mating types, we can do it in the in the discussion. Um, then a couple of other just examples of key words here. Um, if we have a botanical species, a plant, or something studied by botanists anyway, which has separate sexes, that is to say where you can distinguish individuals as male and female, it's known as a dioecious species. But in zoology, um, so we're talking about animals or the things that zoologists study, if we've got a species where we can distinguish separate sexes as male and female, that's known as a gonochoric species. Okay. So these glossary entries embed the conventional biological approach to defining sexes. 
we define sexes by first of all determining whether the species is sexually reproducing and anisogamic. If it, if it is, then we're able to talk about the existence of separate sexes. Then there's an interesting question about whether those sexes occur in different individuals, um, which is another question. There might be separate sexes, but they occur in the same individual. So individuals are both male and female. Um, and in that case, we'll label a, say, an animal species as gonochoric. So this is the approach that I want to suggest is, is basic. What one really needs to understand is how theoretically deep it is. And in particular, I hope you'll see by the end that I think this idea that we define the sex with the smaller gametes as male is often taken as some sort of a convention. And that is, that's to misunderstand it. In fact, it's not the size of the gametes that matters at all. It's the theoretical role that size plays in a much deeper explanatory framework. Okay, so this is a sort of standard model which has been widely accepted since the 1970s of how an isogamy evolved. So the assumption is that uh, in early eukaryotic history, so this is, is way back in, in the early history of life, uh, organisms are isogamic, they're all producing um, gametes of the same size, and that we uh, see the evolution of this new system in which different individuals produce gametes of, di or sorry, different, in which gametes can be of different sizes. Let's put it that way, because you always have to remember our hermaphroditic uh, um, cousins. Um, so the idea is that if gamete size varies, then natural selection will drive the population to the two extremes large gamete producers and small gamete producers because both large and small gametes have an advantage over medium gametes so basically compromised size gametes uh, lose out and that's uh, a conclusion that's reached in the usual way you build uh, a bunch of theoretical models you vary the ways that you model and the parameters in the model and try to show that it's a robust conclusion that across some wide range of models and parameterizations of models, you always end up getting driven to making individuals either commit to large gamete production or they commit to small gamete production. The sort of a background assumption here is that we're talking about something, um, a good way sort of uh, model to have in your mind is coral releasing their gametes into the water column. So gametes have to find other gametes in order to recombine with them and give rise to a new individual. Uh, your, uh, if you produce a large number of small gametes, you've got a much greater chance of finding something to recombine with. On the other hand, uh, when you uh, produce a new individual, it needs to have enough resources to, um, to be able to develop successfully and give rise to to a new individual that makes it to reproductive maturity. So if you're a large gamete producer, you're guaranteed that if your zygote, sorry, if your gamete meets another gamete, it will be well resourced enough to survive. If you're a small gamete producer, you've got a very good chance of finding another gamete, but only if it's a large gamete will the resulting zygote uh, have a good chance of surviving. So these, the, what you get is selection for either um, greater viability or greater productivity. And another way to think about this, and there are some uh, uh, complexities to this, but another way to think about it is that um, small gametes effectively um, exploit the investment made by large gamete producers. So given that some individuals are producing gametes which are able to be viable pretty much on their own, then a strategy, potential strategy emerges of cutting the cost of provisioning. And that's where you get the idea of the so-called cost of sex um, at a population level. Again, complicated debate, but um, at a population level, there are substantial costs to sexual reproduction. The population would be more productive if it reproduced asexually, 
So then you have the interesting puzzle of why anybody bothers to go in for sexual reproduction at all, and a bunch of answers to that that we're not going to discuss. Um, so basically, we've got a, a fairly widely accepted model of something which happens really deep in evolution and means that a bunch of species, those which reproduce sexually, are committed to these two complementary strategies. One is a strategy of producing large gametes and not in, uh, doing much to ensure that they meet, uh, that they get fertilized. Um, and the other is producing small gametes and not investing a lot of resources in them. Okay. So, I mean, basically every sentence of that gets unpacked, but we don't really have time for that. That's kind of the background model. Um, now, important point is that uh, explaining the evolution of sex is not the same as um, explaining, sorry, explaining the evolution of sex obviously is not the same as explaining the evolution of sexes because you can have sex with isogamous gametes. Um, so yeasts, for example, typically yeasts re often reproduce sexually, but they do so by um, uh, different individuals producing gametes of the same size and then recombining, okay? Um, so the evolution of sex is not the same thing as the evolution of sexes, but the evolution of sexes is not the same as the evolution of gonochory. So one thing you could do is to evolve two sexes, but every individual could do both. So classically, the standard kind of, um, you know, undergraduate lecture example is earthworms, because everybody's seen earthworms. So earthworms are um, biological hermaphrodites. They produce both eggs and sperm. And so then we've got the question, why is that not more common? And that actually turns out to be quite a controversial question. What are the advantages of gonochory? Um, one kind of obviously plausible explanation, but one which is, is more, controver more controversial than I would have guessed when you look into it, is that these two fundamental reproductive strategies of either producing a few large gametes or a large number of small gametes favor different adaptations in all sorts of other aspects of the biology of the organism. So for example, um, if you're going to produce a, uh, a large number of, mo of small gametes, you might want those gametes to be highly mobile. Okay, you might want them to be able to, to move around effectively. Um, whereas if you're um, producing a small number of large uh, gametes, you might want them to signal their presence to produce something which allows other gametes to find them. Okay, so you might think that there's sort of a standing selection pressure driving uh, the development of specialized phenotypes which are suited to these two fundamental reproductive strategies. Um, and that sort of seems terribly intuitive, makes a lot of sense, but turns out to be more actually controversial in the literature than, than you might think. Uh, nevertheless, once you start looking at the other differences between uh, male and female organisms, uh, the basic frame for thinking about that is how all the other aspects of an organism's biology can be cued to the uh, one or other or both of the reproductive strategies that organism is committed to. So a relatively common life history strategy, one I always find quite fascinating, is sequential hermaphroditism. So whereas your, um, you know, your classic hermaphroditic organism is both male and female, um, sequentially hermaphroditic organisms are, um, in the cases I'm going to talk about, uh, male at one point in their life cycle and female at another, but it's equally possible for them to be um, male and female on multiple occasions within a single life cycle. So I'm only going to talk about species that sex switch once during normal development, but there are species that sex switch more than once in normal development. So the way this fits into the idea of life history strategy is a very basic biological idea is that organisms become sexually mature and reproduce when they reach the optimal, meaning fitness maximizing size for reproduction. And if you think about it for a minute, um, there's an interesting question, which is why do organisms not 
get born and then immediately reproduce? And there's an obvious answer, which is that when they're born, they have very few resources. So they're not gonna be very good at reproducing. So organisms garner a bunch of resources, grow in the simplest case in an annual plant or an octopus, for example, they grow until they're the optimal size for reproduction, invest all of their resources in reproduction and then die. Okay, there are obviously more complex patterns. But the optimal size for reproduction can differ for males and females. And that can be for all sorts of ecological reasons. Um, so in fact, the kind of patterns this can produce are quite diverse. But given an ecology, the right size to reproduce using a male reproductive strategy and the right size to reproduce using a female reproductive strategy can be very different. So an obvious solution is to simply adopt the sex that suits whatever size you are at the time. So limpets, um, which we've all seen at the beach, your typical limpet species is male when they're small and young, and when they get to a certain size, they change into females. It can be more complicated than that. You can, um, for example, see whether you're, you're succeeding as a male. If you're getting cues that you're succeeding as a male, you can stay small and not bother to grow bigger. Um, so there are more complicated versions of that. So that's starting out male and becoming female. And the opposite pattern seen in blue groper, that's a picture I was pleased to find, that's a, a blue groper photographed at Manly. Um, and uh, they initially develop as females and become males when they get to a certain size. So around, they become sexually mature females at about 30 centimeters and then switch over to male when they're about 50 centimeters. Okay? So sequential hermaphrodism is, a, is a, a common and you know, compellingly smart strategy. It's, it's a good way to do sexual reproduction. So very quickly, I've just been trying to introduce you to uh, what's going on in the biology of sex. Okay, so in evolutionary biology, Biologists are defining sexes by this property of having unequal gametes. And they're doing that as simply one component of an extensive body of theory. So the idea is to organize the pattern that we see across the diversity of life, to put a, a sort of taxonomic order onto all the different ways in which organisms uh, use DNA to make new organisms. And then having created a, um, a taxonomic scheme that organizes the data to be able to formulate and test hypotheses about where that diversity came from and why it's being maintained. Okay. Uh, so the idea you often, I've seen it presented um, as if it was a kind of uh, arbitrary um, decision that biologists have made to say, oh, we'll, we'll uh, divide them into two kinds, depending on which ones have the biggest gametes, as if that was a kind of standalone decision. It's absolutely the opposite of a standalone decision. It's that um, definition is tightly integrated with lots of other ideas, with life history theory, for example. Um, and if you were to, to ditch that definition, you'd have to change a whole uh, bunch of related ideas. And in fact, it would, you know, it would be a very substantial intellectual exercise to try and come up with an alternative way of thinking about this data. Another key point to recognize is that fundamentally, sexes are reproductive strategies. So anisogamy is not interesting in itself. It's not interesting because there are these size differences. If you find a, a, an algae, um, which is basically isogamic, but where there are you know, a bit of variation in gamete size. You don't say, oh, you know, now we're gonna work out which ones are males because you don't think that you're actually looking at different reproductive strategies. You wouldn't even call it an isogamy. You might be interested in, oh, look, we've noticed that there's some variation in gamete size in this isogamous organism. I wonder if it's a good model for thinking about the really early stages in the evolution of sex or something like that, but you wouldn't, apply this definition unless you thought it was linking into the body of theory. So fundamentally, sexes are reproductive strategies. And the fact that we say sexes are defined by anisogamy is not, uh, don't focus on the structural fact that the gametes are bigger and smaller. In fact, it's 
it's equally interesting that they're structurally different, that they're adapted in different, different things. Um, focus on the fact that there are two different reproductive strategies. And what I want to go on to now is to see how the existence of different reproductive strategies in a single species explains why evolution has produced chromosomal sex and phenotypic sex. So chromosomal sex and phenotypic sex, I'm going to argue, are downstream evolutionary consequences of anisogamy. They're not independent. They're often presented as independent ways of thinking about sex. And I think it's fairly easy to show that that really doesn't make any sense, that if you try to think about chromosomal sex independently of the theories about the evolution of sex I've just been talking about, then you won't be able to have anything other than an arbitrary, basically an arbitrary feature of one species that you can't explain why you're fussing about it. Okay, and same phenotypic sex. So here's what the National Institutes of Health tells us um, uh, in a, uh, uh, a newsletter the, when they announced their new policy on sex. Uh, the National Institute said, sex is biological. It's based on your genetic makeup. Males have one X and one Y chromosome in every cell of the body. Females have two X chromosomes in every cell. And we all know the problems about that that uh, philosophers of sex have written about. Um, but uh, those are not the ones I'm going to focus on here. And then formally, more formally in the actual NIH policy on, on, the, on how to do uh, the science of sex. It's been written about really interestingly by people like Sarah Richardson. Um, so lots of interest in, in this policy in philosophy of science. Uh, but in the more formal way, they say sex refers to biological differences between females and males, including chromosomes, sex organs, and endogenous hormonal profiles. So they're kind of fudging a bit there between chromosomal sex and uh, phenotypic sex um, for various obvious, you know, various reasons why um, chromosomal sex on, it own, on its own isn't going to do the work they want. So what's wrong with that? Well, I want to start by introducing you to my friend Rackle, sadly now deceased. Um, Rackle had two identical sex chromosomes, but was extremely clear that he was a male parrot. Okay, so birds, have, so hum, human beings are typical mammals, and the vast majority of mammals are, um, have a heterogametic system of sex determination. Birds have a reverse heterogametic system. So whereas in um, mammals, uh, the, uh, whether you're a uh, male depends on whether you have um, two different sex chromosomes. In birds, whether you're male uh, is the result of having two identical sex chromosomes. This means, for example, that in humans, um, you can tell in advance what sex a sperm is going to be if it succeeds in fertilizing an egg. But in birds, you can't tell in advance what sex of zygote will be produced by a sperm, but you can tell in advance what sex of zygote will be produced by an egg. Okay, so, um, yeah. So, uh, what, what does that mean? Well, the, the point here is incredibly simple. If you're trying to define sex in terms of sex chromosomes, and you look at both birds and mammals, it becomes obvious that you're working out which chromosomes are the sex chromosomes and which ones, which carrier types are male and which carrier types are female by deploying an independent understanding of what it is to be male and female and picking the chromosomes which are associated with your independent understanding of what it is to be male or female. So you don't actually have a chromosomal understanding of male and female. You have an independent understanding of what's male and what's female, and you find the chromosomes, which are the male and female sex chromosomes, using your existing understanding of what it is to be male and female. And that was obviously what was when people discovered sex chromosomes, when Morgan was working out the sex determination system in Drosophila, which is a bit different, but it was the first discovery of sex chromosomes. Um, he was trying to work out the mechanistic basis of uh, sex determination. He already knew which fruit flies were male and which ones were female. And he was trying to work out how um, that was produced um, by, uh, um, to call it the uh, assortment of chromosomes. And of course, this guy, 
doesn't have any sex chromosomes. Okay, he's male because he was incubated between 30 and 33 degrees Celsius. So for a lot of species, the uh, NIH definition is completely not applicable. So why is this a problem? Well, it's, it's not a problem if you're only concerned with humans or with um, the majority of mammals. But it's a huge problem if you're trying to give an understanding of what, uh, a biological understanding of what sex is, which applies across the diversity of life. Okay, that it would be fundamentally, um, I think, a reductio ad absurdum to say, uh, I've got a theory of what it is to be male and female, um, but it doesn't apply to birds or, you know, there are no male birds and no male reptiles, properly speaking. Okay, I think that that would just be a reductio. Okay, so what's going on in this guy? Well, as you, you may already know, uh, being a crocodile, it has environmental sex determination. There are a number of different patterns of environmental sex determination. Um, one pattern is where you simply get males at one end of the, the normal temperature range. But the pattern you get in crocodiles is that second pattern, pattern two over here, where you get males at intermediate temperatures. So the cooler and hotter eggs become females and the ones in the middle become males. Why is this important? Well, what, what's the important lesson to draw here is that sex chromosomes, and more importantly, the sex determining regions on those chromosomes, uh, those, those genetic factors are just like nest temperatures. They're switches that activate a developmental cascade. So thinking about um, chromosomal sex as um, the sort of key to understanding sex, is no more sensible than thinking about nest temperature as the key to understanding sex. They're just switches that throw the genetic system of the organism into one configuration or another, producing a complex downstream cascade of events, which gives rise to, to all of the phenomena associated with sexes. I think a particularly telling case is um, if you have animals that have chromosomal sex determination, but where they choose to ignore it on some occasions. So the, this is an Australian skink. It's got exactly the same, apparently, chromosomal sex determination system that we do. So males are XY and females are XX, but that sex determination system can be overridden by various other factors. It's actually a whole bunch of things that can override it, but a simple one is um, when nests are in the cooler range of temperatures that are found in the uh, normal habitat of these creatures, all of the eggs become male. Okay, so all the, uh, you can actually get the other way around. It, it's a, it has a delightfully complicated genetic sex determination system. Um, what's going on here again is to do with the underlying adaptive strategies. So it's a, an interesting topic in population genetics to look at the advantages of changing sex ratio in response to changing ecological conditions. So picking up cues about what's happening in your local ecology and then skewing your sex ratio to male or female, depending on those ecological cues. Okay. So what we're learning here is that chromosomal sexes are, in fact, you take an existing biological understanding of what sexes are and you find part of the mechanism that a particular species uses to produce sexes. So chromosomes are simply part of one of the many kinds of mechanisms that can be used to produce sexes. So the notion of chromosomal sex is, in my view, sort of um, strictly derivative from an existing understanding of sex and adds nothing to it as an understanding of what biological sex is. The same goes even more obviously for phenotypic sex. Um, just to, to cut to the chase, um, for uh, any feature which you've decided to assign a sex to, um, you'll be able to find a species in which you have the same or a very similar feature, but it's assigned to the other sex. So, um, you know, humans, uh, in humans, uh, we have um, uh, incubation in the body of the female, but in pipefish, we have incubation in the body of the male. Um, and uh, there's the famous example of hyenas, um, where female hyenas have uh, an organ 
which strongly resembles a penis and is used to perform many of the same social functions as penises in male hyenas. So if you don't already know which are the males and which are the females, you won't be able to sex phenotypic characteristics. So again, what I argue is there is no independent understanding of phenotypic sex. Okay, to know what, what makes an organism. Now, this, um, this point has been noticed by a bunch of people writing in cultural studies of sex and gender, um, who've uh, noticed that uh, both when looking at chromosomes and we're looking at phenotypes, that um, scientists are apparently appealing to some independent understanding of what male and female are. And it's, they've suggested that what they're doing is assigning sex to a phenotype or to a chromosome because of its association with a gender. And I guess what's interesting there is that that is, I'm, I, by the way, I'm sure that that happens in some medical contexts, but more generally across biology, the, you're, you're only thinking that's happening because you're sort of not aware of, well, what else could they be appealing to? But what, what else they're appealing to is the idea that there are two fundamentally different reproductive strategies going on. Okay. So just to conclude, chromosomal sex in the species that have chromosomal sex refers to the possession of chromosomes which play a role in a reproductive strategy involving the production of one or other type of gamete, or of course of both. So if you've got a species, um, there are a number of species which are uh, come in two kinds, namely male and hermaphroditic, okay? So how do you know that something is the sex chromosome for hermaphroditism? It would be the sex chromosome, the hermaphroditic sex chromosome, if it was a chromosome which played a role in a reproductive strategy involving the production of both kinds of gamete, okay? So, um, and phenotypic sex simply refers to phenotypic characters which play a role in a reproductive strategy involving the production of one or other type of gamete or both. So if you want to know which uh, nematode worms are the hermaphrodites, okay, you're, by looking at their phenotypes, you've got, first of all, to associate particular phenotypes with the production of both kinds of gametes. So now onto what's probably more interesting for this audience, which is sex as a feature of individual organisms. So how do we think about an individual organism being male or female? And here I'm going to introduce uh, my, uh, one of the things which I'm interested in various other contexts, namely process philosophies of biology. Um, the idea that, this, so the big idea really in this talk is that the key to understanding uh, sexes in individuals is that sex is a process. Uh, not worth trying to explain that except by going through the details. So the first thing I want to do is to introduce the idea of morphospaces, which is an idea many of you are probably familiar with. Um, it's just taking the idea of a state space and applying it to look at diversity of biological forms. So we can take a bunch of different organisms which uh, resemble one another or are different from one another in a number of different respects and we can represent that as a hyperspace where each axis represents one dimension of difference and then we can array the individuals in that hyperspace. Very, very simple idea. That idea is often used to look at a group of related species as variations on a theme produced by a, a small number of, for example, genetic parameters. So we might we might take all the different um, uh, fish in a particular taxon and try to array them in a morphospace space and see, uh, and then sort of see how many parameters you'd need to vary in order to get all these kinds of fish. But what we're interested in is the application of this not to uh, different individuals from one taxon or other, but to different, uh, to individual, to, but to the series of different phenotypes manifested by a single individual during its life. So that's an idea that goes back to originally a book in 1940 by Conrad Waddington. Waddington introduced the idea you can think about the development of an organism from birth to death as a trajectory through a morphospace. So in that diagram on the right, uh, what he's looking at is you think about the embryo uh, 
moving through a series of points which represent different phenotypes. So development is a process in which the organism passes through successive points in morphospace. And what he, what he was actually trying to get at in this diagram before any of these ideas had come in as ideas in, in formal mathematical thinking was the idea of development as a complex system. So what Waddington is, is thinking roughly is that the genotype of the organism uh, is a bunch of parameter settings for a complex system. That complex system has a uh, state space containing attractors, bifurcation points, and all the other um, you know, fun, fun ontology of complex systems theory. Um, and so it's actually an amazingly innovative um, uh, way to think visually about ideas that later became uh, mathematically precise. So what I'm interested in, in particular, is thinking about sex in terms of the developmental trajectories of organisms as those organisms move through a space of possible forms. So here's a morphospace for the blue groper that we talked about earlier. Uh, on the right there, we'll, we'll just look at three characteristics of blue groper. We can look at what color they are on the vertical axis. We can look at what length they are on the horizontal axis. And we can look at whether they produce gametes or not on that third axis disappearing into the distance. And there are a whole bunch of groper. There are some different groper. And we can array those groper in this space. So we can basically put each groper where it fits in this three-dimensional space. Now what's interesting is that when we do that, it becomes evident that different regions of the space represent different stages in the groper life cycle. So down in the bottom left-hand corner near the origin, you've got the juveniles. And bang in the middle of the space, you've got the females. And up in the uh, back right-hand corner of this three-dimensional space, you've got the, the male groper. Okay. I was a bit concerned about this example because it makes it look as if you're moving from juvenile to female to male. Of course, if it was limpets, the males would be in the middle and the females would be up in the top right-hand corner. Okay. Um, Okay, so you can think about regions of this space as life cycle stages in the typical life cycle of the groper. But of course, not all organisms go through the typical life cycle or go through all stages of it. So when this gets interesting is when we then start to represent the life cycle of an individual groper as a particular trajectory in this state space. So the in this particular, in this case here, we've got a groper which starts out, passes through the, so it's here is a little um, transparent embryo, passes through a larvae, passes through the stage, the typical juvenile stage, enters the typical stage of a female groper, and then enters the typical stage of a male groper. And this other individual here, becomes a typical juvenile and then becomes a typical female, but doesn't transition. It never gets particularly big and therefore doesn't transition um, to being uh, male. And this uh, third individual here, something interesting happens towards the end of its um, you know, first few months of life and it never actually enters the region where we find the uh, um, the life history stage we typically call being a female groper. Okay, so it just goes off over here. There's no problem with that. It's a brown groper. It's quite big. Um, it doesn't produce gametes. It's swimming around happily doing, you know, eating invertebrates. All right. Um, so individual fish have individual developmental trajectories. And the point here is that when we start thinking about the sex of an individual, we realize that we're simply talking about a region of morphospace which an individual can drift into and drift out of. So as opposed to the way that people are inclined to think about this, which is an organism is born and you ask what sex it is. From a process point of view, when an organism is born, you can look at the many different potential trajectories it could follow 
some of which will involve being one or more than one sex at various points during its life. So in the case of the groper, I think it's really worth noting that if I've got a groper down here and somebody asks me if it's a male or a female groper, that's just a silly question. It's not a, you know, it would be, it would be um, absurd to ask of a juvenile groper whether it's male or female. And the point I'm trying to make is that we're perhaps misled by some rather contingent features of human biology into thinking that this isn't, in fact, the general way to think about the sex of individuals. Sex is not something which is there at the beginning. It's something which grows. It's an, a region of, of morphospace into which an organism can or cannot develop one or more times during its life. Now that's why I guess a large part of the last part of the talk is about why that's not obvious. But that's a process view of sex. Now sexes in reproductives, individuals who actually produce, who are actually producing gametes is relatively straightforward. So up here we've got a little fish. This fish comes in two kinds, male and hermaphroditic. Um, if we find an individual fish and it is producing uh, small gametes, then we know it's a male. If we find an individual fish and it is producing both small and large gametes, we know it's a hermaph simultaneous hermaphrodite. The puzzle occurs when you, you find a fish and that fish is not producing gametes. And you want, as we are inclined to do, you want to assign it to a sex. So this might be a pre reproductive individual, like the groper we talked about earlier. It might be a post-reproductive individual, or it might be a non-reproductive individual, an individual committed to a life history strategy in which it will never produce uh, viable gametes. And as we'll see, there are plenty of those normal life histories that don't involve the production of any kind of gamete. Um, so, this is the interesting bit, I guess. Uh, and now, first of all, a warning. It's very tempting if we're your, uh, as you saw in that National Institutes of Health definition, it's very tempting to appeal to sex chromosomes when assigning sex to pre and post reproductive organisms. But that just won't work as a general solution. Because of course, lots of organisms don't have sex chromosomes. More importantly, it only works in species with the simplest kind of genetic sex determination system. If, I'm, if you show me an Eastern three-line skink, which has XY chromosomes, and ask me what sex it is, the right answer is, well, um, in many environments, the developmental trajectory of this individual will lead to it becoming male. But in others, it will lead, they, the developmental trajectory will lead to it becoming female. So even when you do have genetic sex determination, it's only simple genetic sex determination, which allows you to make deterministic predictions. So fundamentally, if you, if you try to think about this in a way that works as a general solution, possession of sex chromosomes is never more than more or less reliable evidence that an individual at some point in its life cycle is going to produce one or other type of gamete or both. It's just like nest temperature. So here are some things that you might mean when assigning sex to an individual who does not actually produce viable gametes. You might be making a prediction. You might be saying, I've looked at this juvenile groper or this juvenile skink and I predict that it will produce some uh, one or other type of gamete at some point in its life cycle. But if you think about this as a matter of prediction, so you say we're going to define sex by an isogamy, and when we have individuals that don't actually produce gametes, we're going to assign sex based on our prediction of what kind of gamete they will produce, that's obviously not going to work. It's not gonna work because what about an organism 
which is going to produce first one kind of gamete and then another. It makes no sense with my juvenile groper to say, it's going to produce both kinds of gametes, therefore it's a hermaphrodite. It's a sequential hermaphrodite. It's going to go through, it's going to almost certainly go through a phase where it's female and it's quite likely to go through a phase where it's male. And in, uh, in other species with a more facultative sexual life cycle, it may be the case that all you can say of that organism is depending on the circumstances which it encounters, it may become either only male or only female or sequentially hermaphroditic. And that's just going to be a probability distribution over, over the developmental trajectories given the particular ecology and the particular um, things that that, that population is encountering. So a better way to think about what you mean is when you assign a pre or post reproductive organism a sex, you're reporting a much deeper kind of theoretical conclusion about that organism. On the balance of all the evidence, you think that individual is implementing a life history strategy associated with the production of one or other type of gamete or both. So the reason that when I, um, uh, if I, uh, I look at a crocodile nest and I notice that this egg is in the middle of the nest and therefore likely to experience an intermediate nest temperature, I might say, well, that's a male egg because I think that egg is in the process of committing to a uh, reproductive strategy which will involve the production of small gametes. Or if I look at a, um, a newly fertilized human egg, I might look at that egg and say, my prediction is that this organism is going to implement a life history strategy associated with the production of only large gametes. And therefore I'm going to say that this is a female embryo. The point I'm trying to get at is that the assignment of sexes to non-reproductive individuals is a much more hypothetical activity than common sense suggests. From a biological point of view, the sex of a non-reproductive individual is a, a hypothesis about what that individual is, how, about how the individual developmental trajectory relates to uh, developmental trajectories which have occurred in the past history of the species and play a certain kind of explanatory role in understanding how that species came to be the way that it is. So for example, with that second way of thinking, um, when I say of a postmenopausal woman that she's female, biologically female, one reason I might have a lot of confidence in that judgment is if I'm confident that postmenopausal women are implementing a life history strategy which is part of a life history strategy associated with the production of large gametes. Okay, so menopause and postmenopausal uh, life are, well, there are a number of theories about why these things occur, but none of them uh, involve being part of a strategy associated with the production of small gametes. Okay, they all try to, try to see it as um, something you do in which has adaptive advantages given that earlier on you've been pursuing a strategy that involves the production of large gametes. Okay. Another thing that you might mean when you, when you look at that female worker bee and we say it's a female, we say worker bees are female, but worker bees of course don't produce viable gametes and never will produce viable gametes. And in fact, it would be, um, uh, there'd be something um, uh, deviating from normal development if it were, when worker bees lay eggs below the screen in a, in a beehive, you're looking at something which would normally be seen as a pathological trait in that hive. Um, so what we mean when we say that a worker bee is female is something like the non-reproductive life history strategy implemented in this individual evolved from a life history strategy which involved the production of one or other type of gamete, in this case, large gametes, okay? So worker bees are female because their non-reproductive life history strategy 
is a modification of a life history strategy, which is a female life history strategy, which um, proceeds by the production of uh, large gametes and only large gametes. Um, so what the point I want to make about that is just that in this case, when we're assigning uh, a sex to a non-reproductive, like a worker bee, we're actually doing something quite different. What we mean is something really quite different from when we assign uh, sex to a pre or post reproductive individual in some species. So again, this whole assignment of sexes to individuals that are not reproductives is, it's um, basically taking this, the, the fundamental idea that there are different reproductive strategies manifest in a species and associating in various different ways individuals with those strategies. So it's much more um, a complicated concept than, than you might have thought. So the biological sex of an individual, I'm trying to argue, is, stands in a quite complicated and fractured relationship to the existence of sexes in a species. Okay, so summing up this section, the acquisition of sex by an individual, see how my time's going. Oh, goodness me, I need to wind up. The acquisition of sex by an individual is a process in which that individual implements a life history strategy involving the production of one or other kind of gamete or both sequentially or both simultaneously. Seems to me to follow pretty straightforwardly that at any specific time, an individual organism may or may not have a determinate sex. So the two following two statements are entirely compatible. In this species, there are exactly two sexes. And at any specific time, this an individual may or may not have a determinate sex. Individual developmental trajectories need not be clear examples of any evolved life history strategy. So a particular bee can have its own little life and it can react to its environment and the particular genetic complement it was born with and go off and have a little developmental trajectory of its own, which may be really hard to classify in terms of the developmental trajectories that you think were common and important in the evolution of that species. And that's something we should just expect to happen a lot. Um, I mean, the mutant, I think, you know, it's very unlikely that the uh, um, the anarchy mutant worker bees that lay eggs at Sydney Uni um, are anything other than just, ju they're just like, um, uh, you know, spontaneous um, oncogene mutations in humans or something like that, right? This is not, um, this, you know, these things are just doing something which is, um, you know, a particular gene is knocked out in them and something happens. But it's not something that tells us anything about the evolution of bees as a species. Well, it does tell us something. It tells us something about, um, it's, it, it's a consequence of the fact that their genetic system is a modification of a female genetic system, but that's, that's rather indirect. So those kinds of individual developmental trajectories will defy any simple application of the biological understanding of sexes as strategies of gamete production. So there are going to be individuals where a you know, a completely adequate, clear, well-founded account of what sexes are will not allow you, doesn't have, have any tools to deal with these individuals. Mm -hmm. And that's just fine. Okay, so quick few bit of, bit of philosophy. Um, I've argued that this definition of sexes, thinking, defining sexes as strategies uh, which explain the uh, evolution of the reproductive system of species is the right one with which to address the foundational quest biological questions about sexes. By foundational biological questions, I mean something pretty straightforward. Why are there any sexes? Why do we find particular systems of sexes in this species and not in that species? Okay, so I don't know any other way to anything, how to show those are foundational questions in any other way than exhibiting, right? What is this and why does it exist? That's why it's a foundational question, right? Um, now, those questions are obviously not the ones that are of most concern to people in the philosophy of sex. So an objection that I've encountered to this approach is to say, look, you're just being parochial, you're really interested in evolution, 
your parochial interests in evolution lead you to want to think about sex in this way, but actually we're interested in things that are of much more relevance to uh, social and ethical questions. So for example, we think sex should be defined as a set of phenotypic characteristics that a particular society associates with a gender. And I don't have any problem with that. It's just that I find it perverse to call that biological sex. Why do I say perverse? Because people who refer to biological sex look pretty transparently to me as if they're engaging in some kind of semantic deference. They're appealing to the fact that there is scientific knowledge and my definition is the one that right, um, comes out of this, this. So it's a bit like uh, appealing to physics to define force or appealing to physics to chemistry to define acid. Okay? Um, so if, you're, if you really are talking about biology, uh, then if you're going to get the advantages of semantic deference, namely my definition is owed a certain kind of respect because it does something useful in helping us to understand the world, you've got to take the downsides with the upsides. And the downsides is that that definition is, is not perhaps what you want for your other purposes. So it seems to me that saying I'm defining biological sex, but my definition is only applicable to species with a rich transmitted culture of norms of gender is just kind of silly. Um, you're not defining, you, know, you should either say I'm defining human sex um, and there's this other thing biologists talk about, which I think we should invent a new name for. Let's call it MEX. Okay, so biologists study MEX, which is a species C, which is a, a property seen in all sorts of different species, but we study sex, which is a uniquely human phenomena. And that's fine, this is just semantics. Um, okay, so I would argue that if, if there's any value in distinguishing uh, a biological conception of sex, it ought to be a conception of sex which is applicable to non-human species and plays some significant role in biological theory. I've also had the objection, the scientists who really should control the notion of sex are the ones that do um, uh, sexology or IVF research. You know, the scientists that are, sex is really fundamentally a concept in human medicine. And I guess I'd respond in the same way to that. I just, you know, if, if that's, that seems to me to be a, uh, um, if, you're, if you're happy with the idea that sex is a medical notion and that other species don't have sex properly so-called, I don't, you know, this just seems to me to be a, um, a slightly perverse piece of exercise in semantics. But I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. It may well be the case that uh, IVF researchers want to define sex in a way that is of very limited applicability to, uh, uh, things that are not typical mammals. But rather than saying that's biological sex, I'd be inclined to say again that this is in fact a specific concept of perhaps typical mammalian sex or something like that, right? I mean, there are lots of, in case you don't know, there's a bunch of mammals that don't have um, sex chromosomes as well, right? So it's only typical mammals that do what we do. Um, okay, so just to reiterate the conclusions, if you do buy this as um, a good thing to mean by biological sex, then what you get, which I think is what I'm really interested in, is a big difference between thinking about sexes at the level of species and thinking about sexes at the level of individuals. When you think about sex at the level of species, you get to say some quite determinate things. You get to say that we have a, a perhaps a very well confirmed theory about the evolution of this species. And in that theory, there are the following strategies of gamete production. There are just N of them, typically two. Um, and that uh, we can look at all sorts of features of these organisms as manifestations of these two strategies. So to return to something I said at the beginning, it's a mistake to think that the anisogamy definition of sex is fixated on the size of the gametes. What's important is not that there are two different sizes of gametes, but the fact that those differences in gamete size represent two different reproductive strategies. It's the reproductive strategies that are the interesting thing. Um, 
chromosomal and phenotypic characteristics get sexed only because of their association with their strategies. So then we can see that sexes become regions of morpher space that represent these strategies. They involve gametes, chromosomes, and many other pho many phenotypic characteristics. Okay, so you get so you could almost talk about gametic sex, chromosomal sex, and phenotypic sex all being aspects of biological sex understood as reproductive strategies. So again, it turns out that the view I'm advocating here is not a gametic view of sex. Like, I think that's a very subtle, I probably thought it was a gametic view of sex when I started writing this stuff, but I realized that gametes are just more phenotypes associated with these strategies. And for individuals, um, the pro I think a processual view here really helps. And this, I think, is where we might get some, some real kind of traction on thinking about some of the issues philosophers are interested in, um, that an individual can pass in or out of a sex during its life cycle. Assignments of sex to non-reproductive individual individuals are surprisingly hypothetical and don't always mean the same thing. I think it's transparently obvious that for many individuals, there are stages in their development where they cannot be assigned to a sex. So an early crocodile embryo, a fertilized egg, which has gone through several stages of cell division, does not have a sex in a crocodile nest. Um, a groper, which is engaged in sex switching, does not have a sex at that point. It makes no sense to ask whether it's male or female. Now, that's interesting, but more interesting is that there'll be individual organisms, all or part of whose developmental trajectories are not explained by a reproductive strategy that played a role in the evolution of the reproductive system. So those individuals are individuals where the completely rigorous and adequate understanding of sex in that species is not going to do the job of thinking about the sex of those individuals. The biological notion of sex is nothing wrong with it, it's doing everything biology needs, and it's just not, doesn't have the tools to take every developmental trajectory and think about it in terms of sex. Um, and just reiterating the point, because we're Darwinians and not essentialists about species, the fact that your individual developmental trajectory is idiosyncratic in this way has no bearing on whether or not you are a card-carrying member of your species. Okay, this doesn't have any, you're not, um, you know, less of a groper than the other gropers. You're just a groper whose developmental, whose individual developmental trajectory doesn't neatly fit one of the patterns that's been important in the past evolution of your species. So, conclusion, dull but hopefully welcome. Very little follows from the philosophy of sex, from the fact that humans are a gonochoric species. The biology of sex, I would argue, offers no shortcuts to any substantive conclusions about the, what is the actual diversity of human developmental trajectories or the desirability or otherwise of specific trajectories. All right, that's it. Sorry, a bit long. All right. Uh... Well, a bit long. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Paul, for a fascinating talk. Uh, we're going to start with the Q&A. Um, if you could uh, raise your use 